and we'll get started in just a minute here. Jamie, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Good. Looking, forward, looking forward to today. <laughs> oh, I'm pumped. I'm pumped, yeah. Yeah, it actually flows, I think, really well <laughs> from our discussion on Monday even, which is great. <laughs> Clearly, we planned that. We planned that very well. <laughs> 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 spontaneous order happening, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And just in the interest of time. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for beaming in um, to our ongoing research series. Today, we're featuring our very own Ocean Fellow, Jamie Carini, um, uh, featuring her work in particular on artifact Artis artisanship and aesthetic fact, which I actually found quite compelling and interesting. If you guys remember, Jamie gave some wonderful remarks, which I encourage you to look at if you haven't already during the unveiling of Lynn's statue on campus this last fall. And this is following, I think, a wonderful colloquium even this past Monday. Who knew how many intersections we'd, we'd find <laughs> with a talk on trademarks, right? Um, so wonderful. That's, that's always the joy of these things. Um, so Jamie, thanks so much for letting us feature you today. I look forward to, to your talk. And, and per usual, guys, regarding the format, um, we'll have you know, roughly 25, 30 minutes, whatever you're comfortable with, Jamie, um, to tee this up. Well, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box, so feel free to use that, but also use the raise hand feature. That's a great way that we can keep the queue. Um, so thank you so much again, Jamie, and without further ado, over to you. All right. Well, let me get through the whole share screen bit that we're all used to now um, with right. Zoom. Um, just a second while I do that. Okay. So before I start, I just um, wanted to acknowledge it, several organizations that have really helped support this project as I've as I've worked on it. And this started out as a book chapter for the Mercatus Center. So now it is. Um, it's funny, I've been teed up in so many different ways, not just by the colloquium on Monday, but by last week's um, Ostrom research series on book club, and that featured a lot of work, again, kind of initiated by our friends at the Mercatus Center. So um, so I, you know, I want to acknowledge their support and, and their initiative in, you know, cr creating this opportunity. Um, I also spent last summer at the American Institute for Economic Research, which also has a lot of George Mason people there. And they were, conversations there helped shape this project, as well as all the wonderful support from the Ostrom workshop. So thank you for being my people and providing me with, you know, Al, uh, Emily for providing me with, um, Random re random writings that Vincent had 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 produced. Um, she said that the entire works of Vincent's or, or many of his works have been scanned and they're dig digitally available, which is fantastic because they're, they've not all been published. Or if they have been, they're in, they're, in the, they're in the Barbara Allen collection, which I just hadn't discovered last summer. So I I got to look at Vincent's original writings in some cases. So that was all helpful. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my talk today is on artisanship, artifact, and aesthetic fact, and it's, it is um, take, taking as my starting point work that Vincent um, did on developing this idea of artisanship. Um, he talks about it in probably one of his most known articles, Artisanship and Artifact, um, which was published in 1980. Um, and I'd like to start with this quote from that uh, from that article. Um, this is from the conclusion where Vincent talks about. Um, he says, the alternative to developing a value-free science of administration is to become explicitly aware of the fundamental role that values play in all forms of artisanship in general and in the forms of artisanship involved in the organization of human societies in particular. And so what really um, has struck me in this quote is the relationship between artis artisanship and value. And that's why I think this idea of aesthetic facts can help us to understand um, the role of value um, and human intention as we create organizations or as we create anything in this world. Um, one of my premises is that human, uh, it's taken from Vincent, it's that humans are artifact generating beings. We make artifacts um, wherever we go and, and wherever we work. And so um, one, my alternative title for this talk, which I'll probably use for um, a later development of this project, I wanted it to be the uses of artisanship, knowledge, and fact in the quest to develop a science of culture. Um, because Vincent talks about these ideas of values and artisanship in the context of culture. Um, those of us who are Ostrom Fellows, we took Bill Blomquist's class last semester on um, institutional analysis and development. And a common critique that kept coming up was, how do we deal with culture? Like, what are the tools for dealing with culture in, in the Astromian world? And so I'm gonna argue that this idea of aesthetic fact 
thinking about its relationship to value might help us start thinking about answering that question. How do we deal with culture? All right. So there's an important conversation that's taking place in several publications. Um, I'm Vincent relies heavily on the work of John R. Searle. Um, he in particular Searle's book, Speech Acts, an essay in the philosophy of language. And Vincent, um, Vincent talks about this idea of institutional fact that Searle has promoted, um, which is this idea that we have a brute fact or like some essential physical fact about the world, like it is 32 degrees outside or, um, or E equals MC squared. Um, that would be considered a brute fact, just an essential fact about the universe that you can't necessarily debate it. It doesn't have a lot of other knowledge attached to it. Um, but this institutional fact does, and it's this idea of brute fact plus human institutions. And so the um, institutional aspect is really important um, uh, because it's, it's this idea that there's a lot of human knowledge embodied in one statement. Um, Searle uses the idea of marriage as this idea of an institutional fact where you have two people like Mr. Smith and Ms. Jones, they marry, but within that idea of marriage, there's this idea that you either go to the courtroom or to the chapel and you sign papers and you're committing to live life together as a couple in, in the same household. And, but that all of that knowledge, that institutional knowledge is wrapped up in the word marriage. Cyril also pre presents this other idea about um, institutions or, or about institutional fact. He uses the term the huddle. <laughs> and he, Hurl, uh, Cyril describes it as it occurs at, quote, statistically regular intervals during which organisms in like colored shirts cluster together in a roughly circular fashion. Now, what I just said there would have been an example of a couple of different brute facts, physical facts, but they don't really tell us much about what's going on. We have to know um, the other aspects of the game of football. Like, what does it mean to huddle? Well, it means to pause, pause the time so that the team can, can discuss their next play. All of that is contained in the, the word, the huddle. So the huddle is a type of institutional fact. All right. Vincent picks up on this idea of institutional fact. And in his work, David Hume is a political anal analyst, and this was a, a speech that he gave, and I'm, I'm forgetting the details of where, but it was for the 200th anniversary of, of the um, signing of the American Constitution. So Vincent is talking about this idea of natural, he, he takes Searle's idea of brute fact and says, well, this is a natural fact. And this is this idea, uh, this is him blending Searle and Hume. So Vincent says, okay, well, we've got natural fact, which is like root fact, and we have institutional fact. And if we put them together, we have this idea of artifact, which is, um, which is Vincent's um, reworking of, of David Hume's term artifice. So Ostrom is interacting with Searle and Hume at the same time, and he comes up with this idea of artifact. Again, it's natural fact, like a basic physical fact about the world, and we add institutional knowledge to that. And all of a sudden we have a human creation. All right, then Jane, so, and, and in the same paper, Vincent talks about artisan, artisanship, and it's a quite a lengthy paragraph. I've only extracted like the very essence of it, but here it is. Vincent says that artisanship essentially is human knowledge and action used to transform a conception into some desired effect by working through a process that produces value. We see again this term value with which um, I started off my talk today. Um, I use this example of a potter and the potter, potter's wheel um, as, as, uh, as, for my picture because Vincent talks about the idea of a pot as um, being an artifact of artisanship. And what we see here is that as this potter is shifting this, this clay into a pot, um, we see that he's, he's exerting pressure on the clay and, and centrifugal, uh, centrif I think it's, well, circular motion, we'll leave it at that. I, I will not go into whether it's centrifugal or centripetal, but it's circular motion, it's energy, and it's, and it's coming from the wheel and from the pressure of the potter's hands. But notice the potter's hands don't stay clean. They also get dirty. So in a sense, the pot also shapes the artisan as well. Um, so now James Buchanan picks up on this idea of artisanship in natural and artifactual man. 
Um, and he talks about how artisanship, now you can think of artisanship in the in the terms of applying it to people themselves. And so then Buchanan comes up with the idea of natural man versus artifactual man. Now that becomes important because he thinks of natural man as sort of living in his sort of this world where of scientific knowledge where that is the sort of the privileged knowledge but then he talks but then he contrasts this with the artifactual man whose world is not only contained of scientific physical knowledge but all of these other kinds of knowledge that people can use um, and i need to just backtrack for a sec that was also a, a point that searle made um, when he's talking about this idea of institutional fact he proposes this idea because in the 1960s, um, really, we see at least in the 1940s to the 1960s, economists, linguists, philosophers, political scientists are grappling with what kind of knowledge is, um, what kind of knowledge is, is academically acceptable for us to use in our research and in, in our and in our understanding of people and how they interact in the world. And at the time, and even we see the dregs of this now, scientific knowledge was prioritized above any other kinds of knowledge and even localized knowledge. So, so, Buch so Vincent pushes against this, Searle pu pu pushes against this, and so does Buchanan. Um, and so they talk about this idea of artifactual man. And Buchanan talks about how not only does man interact with his environment, but the environment also influences man to some extent, just as the potter's hands don't, don't stay clean as, as they press upon the pot, because the pot is also, um, is also reacting against the potter. All right, so Buchanan says man wants, and so man, Buchanan also talks about this idea of value, but he talks about it in the sense of utility versus value. Buchanan says man wants liberty to become the man he wants to become. He does so precisely because he does not know what man he will want to become in time. Let us remove once and for all the instrumental defense of liberty, the only one that can possibly be derived directly from orthodox economic analysis. Man does not want liberty in order to maximize his utility or that of the society of which he is a part. He wants liberty to become the man he wants to become. So what Buchanan is doing is he, he um, reaches into the language of artisanship to talk about man as fashioning himself. And, and so he talks about man, not just as an outcome, but as, as participating in this process of self-fashioning. Vincent, so, so, so far, um, I'd like us to compare like artisanship in Ostrom versus Buchanan. And this is um, sort of a summary of, of how they use these terms in their works. Ostrom talks about how human and knowledge and action are the starting point for the process of artisanship. Buchanan talks about how man takes action. Number two, Vincent talks about how he has a conception in his mind. Buchanan talks about imagination. Um, number three, Vincent says that we somebody has some desired effect in mind. Buchanan uses the phrase imagine states of being. Ostrom talks about process. Buchanan talks about becoming, which is a process. But they both end up with value. What does a man value himself becoming? What do we want this artifact to be used for? Like what, how do we value this artifact? All right, well then Ostrom takes these ideas and he wraps them into the idea of public administration to say that administrations are not value-free organizations. Um, the people in them aren't value-free. What he says, we come to even the building of organizations and political structures with a sense of value and which means that we prioritize and we make we make choices and so what Ostrom and Buchanan both really asserted was the importance of people having this epistemic choice or the ability to choose from multiple types of knowledge not just scientific knowledge um, and so in artisanship and artifact which oops, which is where we began uh, where there's where I began this talk with that quote from, from this article, Vincent contrasts this idea of simple artisanship, which is kind of what we've been talking about so far, and he applies artis artisanship to organizations. And he says, this complicates things. He says, human beings are both the material, we're like the clay that the potter molds, um, and we're the artificers. We actually mold the structure at the same time. And so he says, this, this creates problems when it when we have to think about the terms we use to craft these organizational structures. And then it forces us to choose between the kind of authority structures that we have. And so he gives us the choice of le Leviathan or constitutional structures. Um, 
And so I've highlighted in bold this, um, this aspect of organizations as word ordered relationships, because, because uh, I want to come back to this idea of words. Vincent says that language is used to formulate rules, but these rules can change. And he talks about the importance of human intelligibility and agency. And, and that's, I think, you know, we're, what the goal of, of artisanship is, or the goal of artisanship, not the goal of artisanship, an important facet of artisanship is this human intelligibility. Um, and Vincent makes that very clear throughout all of his writings. All right. Now, what I'd like, I'd like to pause here just to, to note that F.A. Hayek, he criticizes the Aristotelian approach to natural, natural fact and artifact that Hume that Hume poses in his, his writings. And so Hayek actually makes his critique in 1988. So by this time, like Vincent and Buchanan have had their ex extended conversation in, through academic writing about, about this. But we don't know if Hayek is responding to them. Um, he does not quote them in his, in his work, The Fatal Conceit, where he makes this critique. Um, I'd be curious to know, though, if he had them in the back of his mind. Um, but. But so now here's this summary of, of where we are so far thinking about artisanship in fact. Um, Searle doesn't talk about artisanship, but he does talk about fact. And it is to push against the idea of a science only fact um, in, ac in academic and human affairs. Vincent also pushes against that science only kind of fact and says, well, we can have, he picks, so he borrows Searle's institutional fact to say, well, people make artifacts through this process of artisanship. Um, and then we have Buchanan, he, take, he picks up on artisanship, sorry, and applies it to people. <clears throat> Hold on a sec, I apologize. Artisanship applies it to people. Um, and, and Buchanan says, we don't just have natural fact and artifacts, we have natural man and, and artifactual man, man who had artifactual man, meaning the product of, of our working on ourselves as artisans. And then we have Ostrom applying artisanship to organizations. And so then we, he thinks of organizations as either natural phenomena, again, coming to this idea of natural or scientific knowledge, versus organizations as artifacts, as things that we actually create. Um, now, I'd like to use a couple of case studies to, to sort of support my, my points on this. And one is Vincent's coffee table, um, because he talks about how he constructs his coffee table um, in his book. Um, the meaning of democracy and the vulnerability of democracies. And he connects this to, to this idea of culture and sort of civilization building. Um, I just want to reiterate that he talks about artisanship as human knowledge and action that transforms, transforms the conception into some desired effect by working through a process that produces value. So we've got our five points there. And we see those points in his description of his coffee table. And he says, Building a coffee table with a cabinet maker involved the use of present means, a concept, to achieve some future, future apparent good that began as a concept of fiction in the mind and was worked through using two odd boards cut from black walnut trees. And I found out just recently um, that apparently they used some of the, the Ostroms used some of the trees that they cut from their own property for the furniture in their home. So that was a really cool fact um, to me. Um, he talks, he continues, the cut edge of one, a piece of slab wood became the service of the table. A conky knot had to be removed and filled with the wedged replacement. Another gnarled and splintered board was used to construct a set of legs. The curves used to shape the legs were later used to construct a lamp from blonde colored gum wood, which is now located in a corner opposite the coffee table. Um, so I did some investigating. I'll come back to this last sentence in a, in a minute, but I did some investigating because I wondered, well, what happened to Vincent's coffee table? Um, it, it, it was clearly a thing because he talks about it and the process through which he made it. Um, and so I, I, I think I may have found it. I hope this is the coffee table. I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, if any long time Ostromians, if you've been in the Ostrom's house and you remember, you recognize this table, please tell me if this is indeed Vincent's coffee table, but I think this is the best that I, this is the closest I could get to it. So this is a, a table in Harlow's house that Sherry um, Rouse, who's our camp, not the, just the campus, she's the entire university, um, 
oh, I forgot her exact title. She, but she takes, she, she knows where all of the material objects are and all the artworks and the artifacts. She, she has the catalogs. And so she sent me a catalog of the Ostrom's furniture. What I find so interesting about this piece is that it, on the left side of the screen, if you look at the edge of the, of the table, you can tell it follows the shape of the grain. Um, it's not just you know cut straight like so many tables are. You can see kind of in the edges, it's been routed, uh, it's been cut really, really nicely, neatly, kind of at a 45 degree angle. Um, we see kind of a knot here to the left, kind of in the middle of the table. I hope you all can see my mouse because I can see it. <laughs> um, we sure can, Jamie. You can, you can? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So this cannot be, I'm assuming this is not the original conky knot because Vincent talks about how he replaces it with a wedged board. But I've, I've looked at the top of this table and he, they must have done a really great job creating a wedge because um, it just, it blends in really beautifully with the rest of the table. Um, but but the idea of this conky knot versus a wedge, I think of that as this idea of an aesthetic fact, like you change the nature of, of the wood um, and it creates a different outcome than it would have been if you had left the conky knot in there. Um, so Vincent talks about how a, another gnarled and splintered board was used to construct a set of legs. I have a photo of the legs in which you can see that he, he uses a really creative approach to like the curvature of the legs. It's not, um, it's very artistic. This leg right here has echoes the uh, edge of the table where Vincent has followed the grain rather than like, cutting it straight or, or curving it with a router. So, and so we can see that there's a lot of intention um, in, in, into this artifact. What Vincent says to conclude is principles of heterogeneity and complementarity were used to put together pieces of furniture that served both utilitarian and I use the word useful, and aesthetic purposes in the ecology and economy of a household. Oh, excuse me, I didn't use the word useful. That comes from Vincent, because <laughs> he's clarifying what he means by utilitarian here. So the gum, the, the blonde colored lamp, it is blonde versus this dark table. And, and so Vincent, and, but he talks about this idea of the ecology and economy of a household. And I think of this as sort of like a shared community in a sense, like these pieces of furniture are different. They serve different purposes in the household, um, but they, but they coexist and, and they, they work together. Um, and I like how Vincent talks about the ecology and economy of a household. The Greeks would have used the word ekoinomia for, for that kind of concept, which we know is economics. Another artifact that, that Vincent was involved in um, the creation of was section was sec, uh, article eight of the Alaska constitution. And as part of that, he focuses on the use of words. And so he creates a draft glossary of terms. And these are the only words that Barbara Allen includes in, in her book. So I'm assuming like this is the complete glossary. Like it literally was just the beginnings of, of a glossary, not really a whole thing. But we see, but Vincent start, defines these four words and phrases because just like wood, um, and wedged boards are sort of the materials that go into the table, which is the artifact. Words are the materials that go into, um, into a constitution. And the artifact, the end product is only as good as the materials that you choose to use. That's why Vincent, for instance, had to replace the conky knot with a wedged board. Um, and this is why um, he's, in, finds the use of words so important with crafting this constitution. And he clarifies the meaning of Article 8 in 1994, but he says words only acquire meaning in the context of shared communities of understanding on the part of people willing to communicate with, un with one another in mutual efforts to cope with problems. Both the intellectual focus in addressing problems of resource development on the northern frontier and the context in which those processes of formulation and deliberation occurred are important in assigning meaning to words. And so I think of this shared community that was the Alaska um, a Constitutional Convention, as sort of like this, like the ecology of Vincent's household that was a shared community, uh, sh sort of a shared environment for the artifacts to reside in. Words here and the materials that go into the artifact of the constitution. Now, Vincent believed that this was so important that he declined to draft this article, even though the, um, that was the original goal of the Alaska Constitutional Convention when they um, 
when they contracted Vincent to work on the constitution. Vincent said, no, this needs to come from your experiences. You know um, all of the issues that you're facing in Alaska far better than I do. And this artic article needs to be in your words as well. And so for Vincent, he knew that if he used his, if he used his experience and his knowledge as the expert, he would create a different article than the people. And he, and, and the self-governance project requires that, that not only the experience, but that the words of the constitution come from the people themselves. And so Vincent as the expert supported that process rather than, um, rather than creating the draft himself. And certainly clear, and so you see in his, his letters that he's clarifying concepts um, and, and phrases. So again, this idea of, uh, well, I, I, Vincent talks about this ecology and economy of a household, so um, which is how I think of the shared community of the Alaskan constitution. Um, this idea of aesthetic fact, then um, I, I do draw from Vincent's use of the word aesthetic. He uses it in three ways throughout his writing. One is the aesthetic purpose of his coffee table that is beautiful. He talks about aesthetic satisfaction, how artifacts are created to be used and enjoyed by human beings. He says their use in employment may be purely consumptive in the sense of deriving aesthetic satisfaction from viewing an object of beauty. Many artifacts are also used as tools or instruments for the realization of still other possibilities. But he also talks about the aesthetic quality of an urban landscape. Um, so again, sort of the sense of aesthetic, of the satisfaction of viewing something that's beautiful. But I'd like to argue that aesthetic fact, um, at least, you know, coming back to Vincent's table, he sees this table as having, you know, a purpose of utilitarian, like you could probably use a coaster and put a coffee cup on it if you wanted to. But it also he sees his coffee table as an object of beauty. But I see this idea of aesthetic fact as being more than just like seeing something beautiful, but as this as this unification of the physical aspect of a thing like Vincent's coffee table with human intention. And so we see this human intention with, again, the way Vincent cut the edge of this table with the way he crafted the legs and shaped the curves. Um, this is more of an 18th century approach to, to beauty and aesthetics. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry, I stopped my share. I'm almost done. <laughs> I just stopped prematurely. Hold on a sec. I have to end my sh end the show. All right, here we are. Um, there we go. Um, so this is an, an 18th century sense of beauty, which is wrapped into the political economy of the day. It seems like people who thought about political economy and they thought about civilization ended up thinking about this idea of beauty as well. In fact, beauty was the term that would have been used in the 18th century. This predates our use of the term, as, term aesthetic that arose in the late 18th century and in the 19th century and was developed in the 19th century. Um, and the, our use of beauty, which is kind of how Vincent uses it in a sense, is this idea of an object of beauty that we contemplate it, but that the aesthetic quality doesn't have any relationship to its use. Nowadays, there are philosophers now who push back against that very romantic 19th century idea and say, no, actually, um, objects that are useful um, are beautiful because of their use. Um, Nicholas Walterstorff is one who thinks in those terms, um, Roger Scruton is another. Um, and this is a very much, very much of an kind of an 18th century idea as well, where we think about political economy and beauty in the context of human ideas, human action and human artifacts. And what we find is that ideas of beauty um, are culturally constructed ideas. And so we find that beauty, idea of beauty or aesthetics is often, dis, is often included in conversations about value to bring us home. And so what I'm proposing then is that we have this idea of aesthetic fact, but that it's being united with this very physical quality and it's this value or that's wrapped up in the human intention that, that artifacts display um, because just as an organization, Vincent argues is not a value free thing. I would also extend that to this idea of artifact, whatever we make, whether it's a constitution or a coffee table, um, they are value laden objects. And um, yes, we do have this idea of, spawn, of, of emergent order that 
that kept coming up in our conversation a week ago during the Ostrom Book Club with Vlad Tarko in particular. But I also think that this is one of the Ostrom's tensions where you have this tension between an emergent order and human, um, and human intention. Um, and so I think this idea of aesthetic fact can help us grapple with that. It can. So next steps, I think we should seriously consider Vincent's exhortation to craft a science of culture. He picks up on this from the 14th century Muslim philosopher and historian, Ibn Khaldun, um, and which, uh, which we haven't really talked about so much, but he is very important to Vincent. I read Aurelian's book chapter um, after he promised to send it to anyone who wanted it. And Aurelian talks about his job talk at IU and how Vincent didn't ask any questions about de Tocqueville. He asked if Aurelian knew of Ibn Khaldun. So we should think about, and Khaldun talks about this idea of a science of culture. And now there's pluses and negatives to that. The pluses could be that we start having terms and words to use to take to be able to account for the human aspects of, of constitutions, political science, public administration that are really hard to talk about sometimes in social science terms. Um, a positive of that might be it becomes easier for people in other aspects of the university, people with working different forms of knowledge to be able to have a space to talk about that in the terms of social sciences. The negatives of that could be that we only talk about say in terms of art or, or um, or creativity in terms of scientific terms. Um, I've, I saw some of those trends in, in a few of the pieces that are out there on science and culture. Okay, and finally, I think we should think of expand aspects of the Lynn's IAD framework, particularly the cultural component of her attributes of the community. Um, to talk about values and, and she talks about values and mental models, but she doesn't expand on this in her book, Understanding Institutional, um, understanding institutional diversity, sorry. Um, and so I think that that those things are really important for us to develop as well. Um, and I'd like to leave us with one final quote where the Ostroms talk about, again, this idea of utility, maximizing utility without attention to the way that ideas shape these leads people to trample civilization underfoot. And so this idea of the science of culture isn't just about how do we understand this, you know, this little piece of our world, although it could help us help us do that but it helps us to understand this idea of civilization and particularly like the value and the fact that like, we can construct the kind of civilization that we want to. And the Ostroms believe that and they helped other people um, to, to believe that as well. Um, so we have to look at where, you know, the intention that has influenced what we've created so far. And we have to think intentionally about where we want to take that in the future. And I know those questions are coming up today as we think about these ideas of civility and how we can test each, with each other. And we, and we talk about, one final thought is we talk about, you know, how polarized our world is today. Well, my, frankly, the world, world was polarized in the 18th century as well. We just don't talk about that because we, we tend to talk about the outcomes of this process of contestation. But um, the Ostroms would say that how that we can develop mechanisms for contesting well with each other, and so um, and so all of these things are wrapped up into this idea of human intention, value, and artisanship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, covered so so much ground, I feel like as well, and it, it connected uh, various streams of uh, of thought from the workshop tradition. So thank you. Um, there's been a really active chat, which has been fascinating, and we're going to get you a copy of the transcript. So don't feel like you have to, you know, digest and respond to it all now in real time. Um, but um, Sandra in particular has been has been quite active. So if you're willing, Sandra, I see your hand up. Maybe we can start with you. And then there's a couple of other folks who expressed questions in the chat. So I can absolutely read them or if you'd prefer to do that and kind of expand on that uh, for Jamie, feel free to as well. Uh, but if it's okay, yeah, Sandra, let's start with you. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, sure. And um, I'm not sure, Jaime, Jamie, forgive me for not having your name correctly. It's Thank you Jamie. so much. It's I Jamie. Yeah, let me help you with that. It's Jamie. Yeah. Jamie, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I should have listened to Scott better. Um, okay, uh, full disclosure. So I've been thinking about facticity, the social orientation around the fact, whether towards or away. Uh, since the mid 1980s, I've been publishing on it. So I'm coming kind of loaded with bear or forebear. 
anyhow, the um, I, I raised several things in the chat, but the question I wanted to ask you now is um, I was very interested in your introduction of thinking about the community level at, towards the close as a direction in which you want to go. There are um, leadership, uh, because of genetic information and big pharma, leadership beginning actually again in the 1980s by the Costa Rican government, there have been efforts to legally claim community level rights to certain kinds of uh, what you would call brute facts and the material associated with them. Um, that's uh, the community level will have a very different relationship to what you're calling institutional fact from the individual level. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, I understand this is a direction you've said, this is where you're going and not where you've been, but what any thoughts that you have right now about what might be different about the individual level versus the community level in relationship to artisanship? Oh my goodness, that is such a really good idea, a really good question. Um, and I was like briefly trying to read some of your points in the chat too. You, you give me a lot to think about. And thank you for being here. Um, so the community, right. So, so, so Vincent found, I do have an answer actually about the community level. Vincent in, in um, Barbara Allen's book, she includes letters of his to John Gauss, where, who was a professor at Harvard, and Vincent was trying to get Gauss's opinion on um, Article 8 of the Alaska Constitution. And he tells Gauss, this was, a, this was an educational experience for me and for the people of Alaska to be involved in this process. And so um, I would say that a constitution is a perfect example of this outworking of community artisanship in which um, the, the constitution went through several drafts and several different committees. And then they had like a couple week period where people from the public could comment on that. And they, they did take in a lot of opinions. They worked with a lot of consultants. It was a years long process. Um, is that kind of, a, does that start to answer your question about communal artisanship? No, I think, no, it doesn't actually, okay. but I, I see okay. why you're linking it. Um, so the difference, what you would want to distinguish would be what you're talking about are the institutional processes mm -hmm. of developing something. I understood that to be embedded in uh, what you were already talking about. Mm -hmm. In the case of saying that indigenous peoples, because of thousands of years of knowledge of how to live in their local ecologies, have a relationship to particular facts. Mm -hmm. That's a very different kind of process. Those aren't the kinds of institutions that either you or the Ostroms were talking about. It's much further down the path of culture. Okay, I see. You're you're thinking sort of in the terms of cultural evolution. Um, I hmm. I my sense is that even even indigenous peoples had struck had structures and institutions though i mean maybe not written in the sense of words and that's probably i'm going to guess maybe a, a defining feature of what you're pointing towards so someone else in the chat as you'll see asked about how what you're talking about relates to anthropology and other kinds of things my own recommendation would be that you spend more time in those areas because i think you'll want to more fully develop uh, what you're thinking here and i'll back off now <laughs> thank you <laughs> I'm sure. thanks for your comments just just the start of a dialogue i have no doubt and so thank you so much Sandra. i really appreciate that um and as i said if you, again feel free to use the raise hand feature everybody um i did see some other useful questions that i'm sure you're perusing as well jamie and apologies for not knowing the name here but the email address is the um s s bud knit <laughs> at iu so if, if you wanted to uh, ask that question live or expand on it please feel free um otherwise i can i can do that it looked like that one was next i uh, have yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, that, oh, that was oh, sorry, Stanley. Yeah, Stanis, I, I didn't yeah, know it was you, ma'am. Apologies for that. Yeah, I just <laughs> I changed realized. my name. I, I didn't realize that I had my email as the as my name. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Good to see uh, you. Yeah, yeah, likewise. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed the paper. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's much, uh, if I can expand that much, uh, just mm -hmm. to, um, as uh, Senator just pointed, uh, because reading in this, I completely agree with the premise that you know culture matters, and that's like the whole the whole premise of my own work. So I fully agree with the premise. But you know, in my work, I, I you know I draw rather on this 
from anthropology, cultural studies, cultural sociology. And so the, the question kind of naturally jumped to me is, you know, what's the connection there? Because we seem to be talking about, you know, the same things, it, it, the importance of culture for understanding institutions and relations, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, we're kind of speaking different languages almost, you know, like different traditions, genealogists. I'm just um, curious, uh, yeah, um, if you uh, plan to draw or have already drawn or what do you think of the connections and, and if your approach can benefit from these other disciplines that, you know, where the premise is the same, even though epistemologically, perhaps they're not always uh, um, uh, the same, start from the same premise. So thank you. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm at this at a point where I am developing this work further. And so all of these suggestions about directions to go, things that I haven't thought about, it's so helpful. Thank you all so much. So yes, um, I had, you know, I had, had not thought of looking like for anthropology or cultural studies, but that's that, but that, that makes so much sense. That would inform my work so work so much. Um, sometimes what I've been what I was doing some some of my approach to, specifically was to look at this idea of science of culture. Has has anyone developed this term science of culture? And there was one scholar who had written about it. His last name was White. So he wrote about it in the early 20th century. Um, but other than that, it's really even Caldini who, who proposes this concept. Culture is a sticky term, though. <laughs> and um, as part of this, this book chapter and this book project that, that those of us were engaged in, um, Mercatus brought us uh, to Fairfax, and we, we talked about this idea of culture. And we literally went around and around, like, what does the term mean? I think for two and a half hours. We spent a couple of sessions on it. And finally, Paul Alajika and, and Virgil Store and everybody were like, okay, let's move on from this. But what we discovered was that it's actually a tough term to define because each, just, each discipline uses it differently. Um, I come from music, actually, and has a very different use than, than what it means in anthropology or sociology, for instance. And so I think what, what you and I think what, what um, Dr. Brayman have really, have really sort of emphasized what I kind of knew in the back of my mind is that we have, I need to define what I mean by culture. And it would be nice, it would be really awesome to have like multiple people contributing to that conversation so that we can come up with a, a shared common term. Um, that would sort of be like what what Lynn Ostrom did by creating her institutional grammar. The idea was 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 to sort of bri build bridges between all these different disciplines. So, yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Um, yeah, yeah. As you can tell, your work is um, is generating up lots of interest from many different levels, which is great. <laughs> it's a good problem to have, Jamie. But I also am aware that you know you have to make decisions <laughs> in your PhD. But luckily, there's a whole research agenda that lies ahead. Um, so it looks like, I'm not sure of the order particularly guys, but on my screen at least, uh, Brian and then Eric uh, were the next two and there were several other questions in the chat that we can turn to as well. So um, Brian? Okay, and I'm trying to actually respond to uh, Bill Blomquist's comment oh, sorry. in yep. the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so Bill may come back and I may be getting him wrong or whatever, but he points to work that Ruth Meins and Dick and I did. And I think a bunch of that is um, drawing on legal pluralism as a way of understanding particularly what happens local communities but then you have a state coming in with its own set of rules and legal pluralists get it, get it much more complexly um, that you have you know, religious views um, you may have projects which kind of have their own laws and so on this idea of overlapping legal fields provides a way to get a handle on it in the ostrom workshop we can think of these as like different rule systems but for the anthropologists, you know, it's not just the rules, it's a whole set of ideas and culture and relationships within which those occur. So that's just an attempt and Bill put in some references, so. That's awesome, thank you. Thank you, thank you Bill and Brian. Thanks a lot, yeah. Brian. And looking forward to your colloquium uh, presentation coming up. It's gonna be great. Um, and then Eric. Hi, Jamie, thanks for your presentation. Um, so when you talked about the uh, Vincent's idea of the science of culture, uh, it reminded me of biologist E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience. I don't know if you came across that. No. But, uh, so as a biologist, he was writing about the, the unity of knowledge and kind of, but it got a lot, this came out like, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years ago now. 
But I remember it got a lot of pushback because it was, you know, imposing, you know, the scientific paradigm on, you know, other, you know, on culture and all these other things. So I don't know, you might want to check that out or I don't know if you have any comments on it. But. Yeah. Can you put that, can you put that book in the chat so I can get yes, it later? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I, I do like to think of this idea of knowledge as being integrated only because I, I do think knowledge is integrated on some level, like knowledge built upon each other. This is why we can have interdisciplinarity, for instance. Um, but I think Vincent would push back against the idea of scientific knowledge as being the umbrella for all of this other kinds of knowledge. Um, I think, I think in the sense, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna like pull the Hayekian cord and say um, that knowledge could be aggregate knowledge as well. And that we don't, we don't even know all the knowledge that's out there. Like one person cannot know everything. Um, and so, but I just don't know that scientific knowledge is the best way to assert this idea of unity of knowledge. I mean, the idea of unity of knowledge has to include culture, anthropology, social sciences, the arts, um, law, because yeah, I, I don't know how you argue for the unity of knowledge from like a certain position, unless you're arguing for the unity within that particular discipline. That's, that's the only context that that makes sense to me. I don't know. But I think one of the things that makes it possible for knowledge, this idea of knowledge to be unified or for us to be able to help have it interact with, with itself or with different forms of knowledge with each other is because of the idea of, of meaning and patterns, patterns of human experience that we can see. And so I think that's, I, I, I've asked this question because I have this facility with being able to like understand like generally like different fields. And I think a lot of us have that where, and I think it comes down to recognizing patterns. Um, in like one field, once you start to, to recognize the patterns in that in that field, then you know the details are what specialists deal with. And in that sense, I'm kind of a terrible specialist. <laughs> but um, but under but recognizing for me, recognizing that each field has patterns makes it a lot easier for me to be able to to learn and to interact with that field. Um, and I think that's why I've appreciated the Astromian approach so much because they also um really believe that and so you see the same concepts and themes come up in their writings over the course of their careers yeah great thanks a lot well, and speaking of ocean book club look forward to featuring your new book eric that's out later this week this year right that's right yeah it'll be out uh july 8th so um maybe in the fall or next spring we can do a book club i love it i love it that's going to be nice. great excellent um, and ju I'm just trying to keep a rough track here in the chat box as well. Again, we'll get you a copy of this, <laughs> Jamie, so no worries. But it looked like, um, Daphna, not to put you on the spot, but if you wanted to expand on that question, feel free. Otherwise, I'm happy to pose it to Jamie for her thoughts. It was about Durkheim's social fact. Hi, sure. Yeah, I can expand a little bit. Please do. Um, I don't know Durkheim at all. So basically, like I was wondering about the intersections, the overlapping and the differences between Durkheimian social fact and the institutional fact that you were talking about. Because basically, when Durkheim is uh, talking about a social fact, he's also talking about something that represents through individual consciousness, but this something at the same time transcends individual consciousness, right? So like it is social, like uh, I don't know, like kinship or like some other ritual that we engage or like a language can be a social fact for him. So like I was wondering whether we can talk about some kind of like maybe like borrowing here or some kind of overlapping between social facts and institutional facts. And and this whole thing also got me thinking like what does this preoccupation with facts tell us about, I don't know, this time that we are living in, basically, I don't know, is it a very, like, modern thing to be, like, looking for different facts, and basically, what does it tell us about, I don't know, the um, epistemological process, basically? Right, that's such a great question. Um, I don't know much about your kind of social fact at all. So you've given me some more reading to do. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, but what, but what the way you're describing it, it does sound very much about this, similar to this idea of institutional fact, probably what I would do then in exploring that is I would look at Searle to see if he and, and Durkheim had interacted at all in their writings, if they were aware of each other, because maybe there's this, shared idea going around at um, at the time 
that that's always the first question that I have whenever we see a uh, similar concepts floating around is okay did this have a source I'm looking for the human intention if I, if I can to see if I can find it um as far as this obsession with fact and knowledge yeah um I think in the academy at least in the arts we're pretty obsessed with the idea of fact and knowledge um because artists have to be able to defend their academic work they're often forced to do it in terms of research and and academic presentations well how do you put a recital like how do you how do you justify the fact that you could spend a year learning a recital program as academic research and all of a sudden you have to use the tools that um that are privileged in the academy which tends to be the the tools of, of the sciences, whether it's the hard sciences or the social sciences. And so those in the humanities then are often grappling with the difference between their forms of knowledge, which are legitimate, and and the uh, fra a lingua franca of the university and how they, they sort of justify their academic existence that way. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that helps answer your question. That's just from my own perspective. <clears throat> I think we all have a wonderful reading list, Jamie, coming out of this. <laughs> so no, I thought you did a great job <laughs> um, responding there. And then um, it looks like, as far as others who have been active, but we haven't heard from yet, I'm not sure, Bill, um, if you wanted to, to weigh in on any of these fronts in particular, um, including if that was the correct coffee table, <laughs> or Bernie, if you happen to recall, <laughs> and then we can turn to Renzo. Or Bill might not be able to... Thanks. I, I, oh, I don't really have anything to add to that. One of the oh, things sure, that yeah. happened, um, one of the things that, that uh, just was a coincidence of, of my uh, time as a doctoral student with Lynn and Vincent was that I, I didn't live in Bloomington and I almost never went to their house. So no, I've told enough. Jamie I'm, I'm of no use to recognize in terms of recognizing their furniture. <laughs> oh, no worries. We can always ask Jimmy um, or uh, or Mike or plenty of other folks too. So and I think you told me to ask Barbara Allen, Bill, and I did, but I I don't I didn't hear back. But she's also on sabbatical, so oh yeah, so I'll try again at some point. Yes, 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 good point. But I would love to know, yes, if if, mm -hmm. if any of you have who have seen the, seen the coffee table can verify this is the thing. Yeah, it does look familiar. It's beautiful. Um, and then uh, Renzo, please. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jamie. Very interesting presentation. Um, I have just a basic question. Um, I, I got a little bit confused with all the different concepts that you're using and in connection to the science of culture. Um, what is your guiding research question for this uh, specific paper? Uh, do you have a guiding research question? I couldn't see it in the paper too. So yeah. I was wondering if you were trying to ans answer something in particular, or it's just an exploration of uh, of Ostrom's work and its work on knowledge and the science of culture, just basic question. Yeah, no, that paper is doing a, a lot of things actually. One is, is highlighting the importance of the development of this idea of artisanship and fact um, and, and throughout this conversation between Ostrom and Buchanan. But the, but the goal of that is, is, is to, it, it is an exploration, but it's an exploration in the context of recognizing that Vincent has said that it's important that we develop a science of culture and that we, we, we don't have one yet. Um, and so that's the overarching assertion I'm making is that developing the science of culture requires understanding that we have a multiplicity of knowledge, knowledge at our disposal, not just scientific knowledge. Um, I, tried to make that part clear in my paper. I know I'd made it clear in my paper than my presentation. Um, and that's the challenging thing about papers and book chapters is sometimes they have to go out even before our ideas are even thought through. And so this idea of scientific knowledge versus, um, versus other forms of knowledge was very much in the back of my mind. Um, as far as a research question, I did not think in terms of our particular research question, but more of the thesis that that developing a, a, a culture of science, a science of culture is work that the Ostroms have left undone. Um, and that, but then my other thesis was this idea of aesthetic fact, thinking about um, our, the, of the materials that we use, not just in terms of like, do they come up, have a beautiful outcome or allow us to live better, but do they also, um, but how it conveys the artist's intention can also help us to think about how we construct the science of culture. 
recognizing that things that that the things that we have the world we live in isn't as much a pro, may, is maybe less a product product of chance than, than what we've been taught that maybe there's a lot more intention but that intention is encoded in all of these symbols of words and manners and customs so that's yeah i don't really have a research question i'm so sorry i never had one whenever i started the project it was a discovery process and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no more like, yeah, no lit, lit review. That makes perfect sense. And did this fits in with your overall uh, PhD as well, Jamie? Or was this kind of a, a, one component, I imagine, of a much bigger project? Yeah, and mm -hmm. in a sense, this was a side project for me. Um, mm -hmm. I had thought I would talk about the idea of beauty and markets, and mm -hmm. but I found that there was no framework to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, beauties mm -hmm. and aesthetics and, and, and music markets are some, some things that I think about. To mm -hmm. some extent, but no, this actually ended up being a side project. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of an itch I was scratching. Now, my my dissertation is definitely more music oriented. Sure. No, I hear you. I hear you by necessity. <laughs> I liked your idea though of you know building out that component potentially of the IED framework if you're looking for you know a hook there. Um, and I'm I'm sure you're already you know in touch with a lot of those folks. But my guess is, and Bill could maybe speak to that as well. There's an upcoming meeting, I'm sure, of the Policy Centricity Working Group. So that could be a fun way to kind of float. That kind of suggestion and see if there's other you know other scholars working in along similar lines <laughs> can compare notes a bit um excellent okay good stuff guys we're we are getting there um oh and i did get a message from bernie saying that he thinks that is the coffee table <laughs> so we, we can double check though of course with uh with with others um yeah sorry renzo did you have something to add there too or a response up, uh, i was just as i was listening to jamie um I was wondering, how are you approaching aesthetic fact? Uh, is it more and its relationship to culture and cultural formation, if that's, or the science of culture, is it? Are you approaching it at the individual level? Uh, because from the, the examples you give, it's more of an individual process, even though it's informed by a, a larger context. But I was wondering how you're approaching that, uh, because you, you refer a lot to the table, uh, as a metaphor in a way or as an example of something else but um it seems to me that it's talking more about the artisan's uh values and how it shapes it's this person's own culture but i, I don't know if i'm understanding well but how are you relating aesthetic fact as part of a, a cultural that, process or studying culture more generally that's such a great question um and i i the way I did present it, yes, definitely was from the artisan's viewpoint. And um, that's how Vincent often presents it. But, if, but looking at the same pa paper that Buchanan, um, the, the art, natural and artificial factual man, Buchanan and even Hayek in his writings, they talk about how culture also acts upon the artisan as well. And so the end result in a sense is this combination of culture and the artisan and there's all sorts of intentions being built into this thing. But the idea is it didn't just appear and it's not just a value free. Like the very nature of values means that we have to have prioritize and make choices. I think about Vincent's coffee table as an example because um, you can see the wood, he chose the piece of wood, but the grain in that wood was provided by the tree and by the rain that fell on the ground. And so in a sense, I guess if you think about wood like the culture, I mean, it, pro it provided its own materials um, to the art, to the uh, to the process, and and Vincent just decided to follow the grain of that wood on one edge of the table. But but he, even he was also taking information from the tree and using that to inform his to inform his choices. So in a sense, he was working with. I hope I I don't know if that's a very clear answer. It's, it's a complicated topic. I've really tried to think through it as carefully as I can. Oh, no. um, I think it's an ongoing conversation. <laughs> certainly, certainly. There's lots of moving pieces and and we're pretty much out of time, but Sandra, uh, did you want to maybe jump back in with a final thought there? That'd be great. Yeah, just briefly on the, on the uh, question asked by Renzo. So mm -hmm. when you explicate a concept, really you want, you need to do it on two levels, the theoretical and the operational. Um, so when you are talking about the question of what an aesthetic fact is, you aren't offering an operational definition, but you're using operational processes to exemplify what you mean. Um, do you have a theoretical definition of aesthetic fact yet? 
Yes, the idea of physical fact plus value or human intention. Um, I can, yeah. And it may be a terrible one. It's just it's just a working definition. Um, this is the part of my project that's very much in process, that's being shaped and formed. And that's why I was wanting to, to present it today. So yeah. So there... just a brief feedback. I think that for most people, the word aesthetic would push you far beyond institutional fact and brute fact. It's something in addition you'll want to develop to say about that because otherwise it again collapses into Durkheim. It collapses into Locke and so forth. Okay, great. And as I learn, study Durkheim and Locke and, and those sources you pointed me to, um, that will help me avoid avoid that. Thank you for thank you for that direction. You know, yes, indeed. Thanks, Sandra. And thank you, Jamie. This has been, as you can tell, very stimulating for all of us. So I really appreciate it. And thanks again for the opportunity to feature your work. <laughs> thank you um, so maybe one last round of applause for Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you look forward to continuing um, to follow this with, with great interest. And just as a final reminder, guys, we do have a uh, Tocqueville lecture this Friday, um, and that is with George Thomas from Claremont McKenna College on James Madison and the Logic of Republican Government with his recent essay uh, from The Atlantic being featured. So look forward to that. Look forward to next week, of course. Um, thanks so much again for joining. Thanks in particular to Jamie. Great job. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your days. Thanks, everyone. Take care.